Dr. Tarui graduated from David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and completed her psychiatry residency at UCSF. During her training, she served as the chief resident at San Francisco VA Medical Center and completed additional training in women's mental health area of distinction. She developed a strong interest in both reproductive psychiatry and infant mental health during her training at the Infant Parent Program at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. Currently, she serves as the medical director of the MOMS program and has particular interest in peripartum slash postpartum mood disorders and infant parent psychotherapy. On a personal note, I just love her. She's a fabulous colleague, a gifted psychiatrist, and a joy to work with. She will be presenting on approaches to treatment in the perinatal period. Please welcome Dr. Tarui. Hi, my name is Nicole Tarui. I'm the medical director of the Maternal Outreach Mood Services Program at El Camino Hospital. Today, I'll be presenting a talk to you titled Approaches to Treatment in the Perinatal Period. The learning objectives for today's talk include being able to differentiate three key themes or challenges that commonly occur in the perinatal period, um, to be able to differentiate three key therapeutic interventions to improve mental health outcomes, and lastly, to identify three different therapeutic modalities used in group and individual settings. First, I wanted to start out by sharing recent findings of the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale scores in the MOMS program. We know that during the perinatal period, one in seven women will go on to develop a mental health condition during this time. In our program, we typically see patients whose symptoms are in the moderate to severe range. Conditions include postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, even postpartum psychosis. As part of this analysis that we presented at APA last year, we tracked 88 patients who were engaged in the partial hospitalization program and the intensive outpatient program from July of 2020 through July of 2022. What we found across all diagnoses was that there was an average 60% decrease in EPDS scores from the time of admission to discharge. Clinically, this level of improvement reflects a patient's ability to return to their baseline, to care for themselves, and also to care for their baby. Based off of the feedback from previous symposiums, many attendees have asked how we approach treatment in the MOMS program, which is the basis for my talk today. To highlight the approaches to treatment that we most commonly use, I'll be sharing the story of a patient I worked with from pregnancy through postpartum. For confidentiality reasons, I've changed the patient's name and some details. Cindy was a 32-year-old woman who entered the mom's program when she was 28 weeks pregnant, pregnant with her first baby, a baby boy. She shared that she had had a prior history of depression and anxiety and endorsed feeling waves of sadness that started in adolescence. Most recently, uh, during her first trimester of pregnancy, Cindy started experiencing a sense of doom and gloom whenever she felt baby kicking. She often felt that there was no meaning to life during these moments. She also noted that during her first trimester of pregnancy, she began experiencing low energy, poor sleep, difficulties concentrating, and a loss of interest in activities that would typically be enjoyable for her. She was also noting a really high level of anxiety with persistent worries about becoming a mother. She was concerned about her symptoms and wanted to seek help prior to her baby's arrival. Her OBGYN referred her to the MOMS program. Cindy shared that when she found out she was pregnant, she initially felt surprised, but this was quickly followed by doubt. She wondered, how will I be able to juggle my job caring for a baby? Will my husband still be interested in having a relationship with me? Will he still love me? 
how will I know how to be a mother? She shared that with all of these worries on her mind, it was not only difficult to remain present, but she also began feeling irritation when she felt baby moving. She described feeling resistant con to connecting with her baby. In Cindy's experience, she was feeling significant ambivalence about her pregnancy as well as motherhood. Several core themes that arose, and this is fairly common for many patients I see, um, both during pregnancy and postpartum, um, primarily around fears around identity shifts. For Cindy, um, she was really thinking about different aspects of her identity as a professional, um, being a wife, and also her role as a mother. How will all these different aspects of herself come together? She also noted that she had difficulties connecting to the pregnancy and often sensed um, a sense of resistance. When approaching ambivalence around pregnancy, interventions that we focus on include normalization, further assessment, and supporting attachment. Normalization happens naturally in the group setting. Many patients learn from one another that they are not alone in their experience of ambivalence. A lot of parents feel significant shame around this, and the group setting is a wonder wonderful experience for patients to be open about how common this truly is. Adjusting to the idea of pregnancy and entering parenthood is daunting for most first-time parents. We also normalize this experience in individual therapy and provide a framework for understanding why this occurs. In order to help patients understand the origins of their ambivalence and difficulties connecting to pregnancy, we use a tool that was created in the MOMS program called the Reproductive Journey Assessment. We ask patients to fill out a questionnaire that we discuss in individual sessions. What we aim to understand is a patient's experience with previous losses, whether their current pregnancy was desired, and how they're beginning to imagine what their baby is like, and any attributions, whether positive or negative, to baby. We can understand a lot through simple questions such as how they chose the baby's name, how they would describe their baby, or any meaning they're attributing to baby's movements. As we began doing the work with Cindy, first to normalize her experience of ambivalence, we began to understand more about her feelings towards her pregnancy through the reproductive journey assessment. She did report that this pregnancy was planned and desired. However, she experienced significant nausea and fatigue early on. This made it really difficult for her to continue working. She also shared that she had strong negative feelings towards the baby's gender, and she disclosed a history of sexual trauma in her teens. Whenever she felt baby moo, she not only felt ongoing waves of sadness, but she felt irritated and wondered if he was purposefully waking her during the night. As we began to understand Cindy's history of trauma, she also shared a lot of painful memories as a child. She described her early experiences with her mother and father as being aloof and disconnected. She often felt rejected and alone. She began to see a little more clearly how these past experiences made it difficult for her to imagine a happy life with her baby, and this was contributing to her feelings of ambivalence. She was also able to see that baby was distinctly separate from the past, and she felt empowered to work through these painful experiences so that it didn't impact her connection with her baby. Cindy shared that she was primarily raised by her grandmother, with whom she was very close to throughout her childhood. This maternal figure was so important to her, and she wanted to provide the love and care to her baby as she had received from her grandmother. She chose to name her baby Alex, which was in honor of her grandmother, Alexandra. During individual therapy and group sessions, 
with Cindy's permission, we began talking to Alex directly. When Alex would kick, we became curious together about what he was doing. And Cindy shared one day, I think he's telling me that he's growing and his kicks are a reminder that he's doing okay in there. By giving Alex a voice in both individual and group work, Cindy was able to experience Alex as separate from her past and her attachment with him continued to improve over time with joint activities. She began talking to Alex, singing to him and reading books to him. As we previously touched upon, Cindy experienced a resurfacing of childhood trauma during her pregnancy. This is a very common occurrence that often arises in pregnancy, but can also be prevalent postpartum. During second and third trimester of pregnancy, when baby's movements can be felt, the baby goes from being an imagined baby to a symbolic baby and there can be significant meaning tied to the baby, which is directly connected to the history of the parent. What I also commonly see is identification with the baby. In some situations, it isn't unusual to see a regression in the expecting parent, many of whom have described feeling needy or wanting to be cared for. Issues around trauma or neglect have to be resolved in order for the patient to begin to see their baby as separate from themselves. In the ideal situation, the parent can resolve these past conflicts and mentally prepare to care for their baby in a secure way. Cindy shared with me that she often felt significant jealousy towards her baby when her husband would caress her belly. She felt ashamed of feeling this way, and it was often perplexing to her why she felt this. When we started to discuss her childhood, she shared that her mother and father weren't really present. She endorsed that her grandmother had cared for her from birth, and she described her relationship with her mother as complicated. She recalls that her mother told her she was a nuisance and purposefully neglected her when she was a baby. When Cindy was 12, she moved to the U.S. from Korea. Her father and grandmother stayed behind, and she rarely saw them after that point. Her mother told her many times that she preferred her father over her. Cindy recalled not feeling loved, lonely, and sad. Cindy was terrified of repeating these painful experiences with her baby and worried about her ability to care for him. Core themes that are very common and occurred in Cindy's experience included an acute awareness around emotional neglect and abuse from her mother, jealousy, and worries about repeating the past and doubts about her abilities to become a mother. A significant aspect of the interventions that we utilize in the MROMS program when addressing the resurfacing of childhood trauma include understanding how trauma is impacting not only the patient's individual experience, but also the attachment to baby. Given our treatment in the MOMS program is time limited to about eight to 10 weeks, our goal is to help support the patient around attachment with their baby and eventually assist with the patient transitioning into longer term trauma therapy at the point of graduation if that's needed. In Cindy's case, what was particularly helpful was for her to understand the origin of the waves of sadness and jealousy. When I asked her to try to recall the first time she experienced those feelings, she had a vivid memory that came to mind. She shared that she could remember herself as a 12-year-old girl recently immigrated from Korea, sitting alone in her room. She was lonely and sad with no one to comfort her. She wondered what the point of her existence was. When she did ask for comfort from her mother, she recalls her mother scolding her. After her bid for affection, her mother abruptly left her with a neighbor several days later and returned to Korea to visit her father without her. 
Cindy was then able to articulate, there was only enough love for two people in my family. I was the third person and there wasn't room for me to be loved also. Cindy could see that this was connected to her feelings of jealousy towards her baby as she feared that there was only enough room for her husband to love her baby and not her as well. A key intervention we used here was to connect her current emotional experience to a memory from her childhood. We utilized both psychodynamic psychotherapy and cognitive behavioral therapy skills to really investigate her core belief that love could only exist between two people. Ultimately, Cindy came to the realization that the love in her own family did not have to be finite, and she could choose to create a completely different experience in her own family. As we continued to do this work together, Cindy also experienced significant grief. As she imagined what she could do differently as a mother, she was struck with the grief related to the loss of the childhood that she wished she had had. As we worked through this, eventually she was able to identify feelings of sadness, anger, and also neglect. As she prepared for birth in her last trimester of pregnancy, it was incredibly important for her to connect with her own inner child that often felt neglected. She was gradually able to identify ways that she felt supported, ask for the support from loved ones and her team of providers in the mom's program, and also receive that support. She shared that depending on others was a new and scary experience for her, but it also felt incredibly comforting to be able to feel cared for at such a vulnerable period in her life. Cindy's story highlights the specific interventions, which included connecting current emotional experiences to painful childhood memories, support around grief, and helping her to connect with her inner child. A significant intervention was also separating Alex's association with feelings related to the emotional trauma she experienced. We refer to this as reflective capacity which is the parent's ability to understand their own history and how it can impact their feelings towards baby and ultimately attachment. The goal is for the parent to see how relationship dynamics from the past may come up in their relationship with their baby. The hope is to prevent repetition of intergenerational trauma. While we identify painful aspect of the, of the parent's childhood, we also help to support them in identifying their best hopes and what they would like to do either similarly or different for their own child. As Cindy prepared for labor and delivery and the postpartum period, she shared many worries about the birthing process and feeling vulnerable. Because of her history of sexual trauma, she was quite concerned about feeling unsafe. She worried frequently about who would help her postpartum and if she would develop worsening depression or anxiety. Core themes that we saw included fears related to uncertainty and past sexual trauma, worries about the postpartum period, and also concerns about developing worsening symptoms of postpartum depression, as well as anxiety. To address the concerns that Cindy expressed about labor and delivery and the postpartum period, numerous interventions were done. Firstly, we collaborated with her OBGYN about trauma-informed practices in labor and delivery. We provided education to her and her partner, and Cindy felt empowered to advocate for herself. Examples of what felt helpful for Cindy included requesting female providers, if possible, limiting the frequency of cervical checks, and having clear communication with providers if she was in distress. Having this clearly outlined and sharing it with her medical team 
helped mitigate some of her anxiety related to labor and delivery. We also supported her in creating a birth plan in addition to a postpartum wellness plan that I will share in the next two slides. For Cindy, she shared that the most important aspect of her postpartum period was that she wanted to feel well and enjoy bonding with her baby. She wanted to have a clear plan for how to identify and mitigate risk factors for postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety. We had a clear plan for protected sleep, who would be helping to support her, the plan for ongoing medication and possibly increasing her antidepressant if needed, and providing information about the potential mental health impact of breastfeeding. Her partner was very involved in these discussions and planning ahead. Communication for Cindy was a very big area of challenge. We worked on being able to be direct and communicate her needs, which was something new for her. Specific therapeutic skills that were integrated into both her individual and group therapy included interpersonal psychotherapy as well as dialectical behavioral therapy. For interpersonal psychotherapy, um, what we really focused in around was owning her own individual role in relationship interactions. For DBT, um, she found it very helpful to use Tear Man as well as practicing setting boundaries. In the postpartum period, she found these skills to be very helpful, especially navigating complicated dynamics with her in-laws. About six weeks postpartum, Cindy reached out to the mom's program and let us know that she was having a hard time and wanted to return. She shared that a big trigger for her worsening symptoms was challenges around breastfeeding as well as sleep deprivation. Despite our best efforts to have a plan for protected sleep, a minimum of five to six hours per night, Cindy found herself often awake worrying about Alex. Unfortunately, he was experiencing difficulties with feeding and Cindy found herself worrying about his well-being and if she had done something wrong. Despite pumping and breastfeeding causing significant stress and taking a toll on her physically, she felt too much guilt to wean. She also noted feeling very anxious and tearful when breastfeeding. Core themes that she was experiencing included significant guilt around having difficulties breastfeeding, potentially weaning. And she also experienced significant distress while breastfeeding, which we believed was likely linked to her history of sexual trauma, in addition to dysphoric milk ejection reflex. Cindy was a big fan of Emily Oster, who has a fabulous book and information that breaks down the available data for many topics related to parenthood. In particular, breastfeeding is a big topic that many first-time parents worry about. Cindy went to access the information, and we encouraged her to educate herself about the objective benefits of breastfeeding versus formula and to make an informed decision that felt right for her as well as her family. We also had many conversations about the potential mental health burden of breastfeeding, which isn't as commonly talked about. In particular, we discussed that disrupted sleep was a big risk factor for her symptoms of postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety. She decided that she wanted to combination feed with both breast milk and formula, and she began asking her partner for more support overnight and asked him to do one to two feedings so that she could begin sleeping a minimum of five to six hours uninterrupted. For her symptoms of Deemer, simply naming her experience was a very big first step for her, which felt validating. We also integrated numerous grounding and mindfulness, mindfulness skills, which she benefited from significantly. 
In particular, she found that using a countdown, knowing that the moment of dysphoria would pass, and also using grounding skills helped um, the sense of distress pass quickly. When Alex's feeding difficulties started, Cindy noticed that she began experiencing distressing images of Alex choking when she was feeding him. Initially, the thoughts were very brief and infrequent. However, with ongoing sleep deprivation, she noticed a few weeks later that she was also experiencing distressing images of seeing herself falling asleep while feeding him and accidentally suffocating him. This thought was so alarming to her that she asked her husband to take over feeding Alex the majority of the time. She was too ashamed to tell her husband about the thoughts, and she wondered, what kind of mother am I to be having these horrible thoughts about my baby choking or suffocating? And what if this actually happens? This further led to her doubts about her abilities as a mother, and she started to spend less and less time with Alex. She was terrified of harming him in any way. During a group session on intrusive thoughts, many peers in the mom's program shared similar experiences. Cindy shared that for the first time, she was learning what these thoughts were and that there was a name for them. She was also struck by how calm it was amongst the other mothers, and this provided a sense of relief for her that she wasn't the only one experiencing this. In both group and individual sessions, we frequently discuss that up to 50% of postpartum women experience intrusive thoughts. We also highlighted that the thoughts were simply thoughts and did not define her as a mother. She noted that when the intrusive thoughts occurred, she would often find her anxious mind grappling with her rational mind. There would be a dialogue back and forth um, where she was trying to provide reassurance to herself. However, the intrusive thoughts and anxious thoughts just kept coming back. It was quite exhausting for her, and she noted that it often made it difficult for her to stay present with Alex. We discussed mindfulness skills, and instead of engaging with the intrusive thoughts or the anxious thoughts, she was able to accept that they were happening and could simply observe them passing by like a little cloud. She also noted that adjustments to her antidepressant had also made impact on the frequency and the intensity of the thoughts. As her symptoms continued to improve, spending time with Alex felt a little more enjoyable. She recalled a moment of laughter for the first time together in a really long time, and she shared how wonderful it felt to be present in that moment with Alex. The Perinatal Anxiety Research Lab at the University of British Columbia has this amazing infographic on postpartum intrusive thoughts. It's a wonderful resource that I share with all of my patients experiencing intrusive thoughts for the first time, um, and it's easily accessible on the internet. It helps to normalize as well as educate um, patients on the prevalence as well as the treatment for intrusive thoughts. Cindy began bringing Alex to the mom's program when he was about eight weeks old. In our dyadic sessions, Cindy would often worry about becoming like her mother. She had hired a nanny to help support her several days per week, and she feared that Alex had developed a preference for the nanny. She worried that she was giving up her responsibilities as a mother. She also frequently compared herself to the nanny and wondered, am I doing this right? Maybe she knows how to care for him better than I do. Alex continued to have difficulties with breastfeeding and eventually refused to breastfeed altogether. One session, Cindy came in crying, stating that she knew that Alex was rejecting her 
because he didn't like her. Despite all of her best efforts to do what she was, she felt was best for Alex, she continued to feel overwhelmed and defeated. She had every intention of providing loving care and support to her baby, but she felt that some moments were so hard and she often found herself wondering, why didn't my parents care for me this much? Moments of joy quickly turned into sadness. When Cindy and Alex were in the room together, I often found her preoccupied in her distress and his bids for attention, like cooing and smiling at her, were often missed. Cindy and Alex began engaging in infant parent psychotherapy in both group and dyadic sessions. Having both Cindy and Alex together in the mom's program gave us a lot of information about the attachment that was forming. It also provided the unique experience of delivering dyadic interventions in real time. In groups, Cindy began to learn about infant parent psychotherapy and understand concepts that were relevant to her bonding with Alex. Some of these topics included developing reflective capacity, enjoying activities together with joint attention, and the interconnection between a parent and child's ability to co-regulate when distressed. The group therapists would often become curious with Cindy about what Alex was trying to convey to her in group sessions. She could also see how other parents might be interacting with their babies and responding to their cues. Cindy and Alex's attachment was also supported in occupational therapy, where Cindy learned how to do infant massage for Alex. With the guidance of our occupational therapist, Cindy became more comfortable with these moments of connection over time. She found that she can enjoy being present with Alex when focused on the task at hand. In dyadic sessions, we started out by becoming curious about Alex's experience and what he was trying to tell us. Similar to her experience in pregnancy, when she began to become curious about his movements in the womb, she started to wonder what his different cues were and what he was trying to tell her. By gently directing her attention to Alex's bids for connection, when he was cooing or smiling, Cindy was then able to attune to him and say, oh, look, there was a smile. Maybe that was meant for me. As our work progressed and she was able to attune to Alex's needs more and more, I saw her confidence in her abilities as a mother start to grow. She was then able to discuss how challenging breastfeeding had been for her and the, and the grief that she had about Alex's refusal. To wean would feel like a failure and she was overwhelmed by guilt. She also felt that Alex was rejecting her and perceived that he didn't like her at times. We utilized cognitive behavioral therapy skills to investigate if this thought was true and what evidence she had that either supported or negated this. She ultimately came to the conclusion that there might be alternative explanations for Alex's refusal of breastfeeding. This prompted her to seek support from a lactation consultant who helped diagnose Alex with a mild tongue tie. Having this information felt like a relief to know that there was not only an explanation, but also a treatment. Um, Alex soon began feeding with greater ease. As we process this, Cindy was able to identify the automatic thought pattern that came up for her. Rejection by loved ones was something she had grown up feeling often. With her skills in reflective capacity, she reminded herself that even though she grew, grew up feeling love was scarce, this did not have to be the case with her own family. She could look at her thoughts in a more balanced way and see that the feeling of rejection was tied to her own childhood. She was then able to bring herself into the present moment 
and continue to form a beautiful connection with Alex. In the next two slides, I included handouts from two different infant parent psychotherapy groups in the MOMS program. To highlight the capacity for reflective functioning, we created a curriculum that both addressed the experience of the parent as well as the infant and the child. The content for this group was based off of Dr. Maria St. John's book titled Focusing on Relationship, an Effort That Pays. Dr. St. John was my supervisor when I trained at the Infant Parent um, Psychotherapy Program at San Francisco General Hospital when I was a resident. She beautifully outlined 20 different parent-child relationship competencies, also known as PCRCs. Reflective capacity is one of the most important PCRCs. In this particular group, we help patients not only recognize when they are feeling distressed, but also ways to help regulate. Recognition of a parent's own internal experience is vital to the parent-child relationship. When a parent can identify their own emotional experience, pause, and utilize skills to regulate, they can then return to a difficult interaction with their child and also do the same for that child. The parent's ability to do this for themselves also helps to model to children emotional awareness and ways to cope. Being able to recognize what is happening for the infant is also a key aspect of reflective capacity. Specific ways that we help patients understand this is through observing cues such as facial expressions, behaviors, and then helping them identify what their baby may be feeling. With this information, they can then find ways to help soothe their child depending on what they're experiencing. Meeting their child's emotional and physical needs is the basis to supporting secure attachment. PCRC7 is the joys of joint attention. Cindy, like many first-time parents I meet, come to program that they aren't doing enough for their child. Being a good mom is equated with doing rather than just being together. I found that the richest moments for many of my patients and my own experience being a mom come simply from being in the moment and enjoying something together. Cindy would often share with me that having a newborn felt awkward at first. She wondered if Alex got bored hearing her narrate her day or sing, and she would often find herself wondering, what should we do next? As this group goes over, researchers propose that infants find motivation and interest to pay attention to the world around them on the basis of the passionate interest of their caregivers. A parent can guide a child's attention towards opportunities to learn, interact, and have curiosity and focus. As parents, we also learn to stop the interaction when baby disengages. We allow them to take space and to rest so they may trust their own ability to self-regulate. Examples of joint attention may be lying under a mobile, pointing and describing one's experience, gently touching baby's fingers to different textures or colors and explaining it to them. The more a parent teaches a baby to focus and notice the outside world, the richer and safer the baby's understanding of the world will be. My hope for every patient is by the time they graduate from the MOMS program, they have a toolkit of skills to be able to help with symptoms, not only while they're in treatment, but well into the future. For Cindy, she made significant progress through the use of cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical behavioral therapy skills, integration of infant parent psychotherapy, as well as interpersonal psychotherapy. She was able to create a coping card that she carried with her in her wallet with a list of skills that she had learned. The coping card also included a list of triggers, early warning signs, and skills that she had practiced before that she knew were helpful. 
As you can see on the card, she listed skills such as mindfulness, utilizing her five senses, reading, and going for a walk, and meditation. This coping card was a reflection of Cindy's progress. And she shared on her day of graduation that she was leaving, feeling a sense of renewed hope and connection with Alex. Before, she had felt very alone and isolated during her pregnancy and the early days of motherhood. She left knowing that there is a community to support her and that no matter what challenges in parenthood arise, she could ask for and also receive support. Most importantly, she felt that through her understanding of her own painful experiences in childhood, she could move forward in her own journey as a mother with many hopes for doing different thing, di things differently for her and Alex. Cindy's recovery is really a reflection of her strengths and her hard work, in addition to her ability to make use of the treatment team in the mom's program. She had access to numerous providers who worked to understand her unique strengths, her history, and to provide support in an individualized way. For providers, it is invaluable to have an interdisciplinary team. The MOMS program, we have social workers, psychologists, licensed marriage family therapists, occupational therapists, nurses, and perineal psychiatrists. Collaboration and working closely together on a daily basis is a vital part of our work. We also continue to have ongoing education and collaboration with other providers on a frequent basis, which I think tremendously helps to improve the quality of care that patients receive. I wanna thank you so much for joining me today for my talk. Um, my contact information is listed here. I also wanted to acknowledge our wonderful moms team who we couldn't fit all in one picture. Um, they're doing the fabulous work of helping parents navigate the early challenges of motherhood um, and are just fabulous to work with. I will pause here um, and end for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tarui, for that fabulous presentation. Now we would like to get some of the questions that are coming in from our guests. If you haven't put in your questions in the chat box, please do so. <clears throat> Our first question is, could you speak a little bit more about how to utilize the pregnancy journey assessment? Yeah, so we meet as a team on a weekly basis and we discuss where the patients are at in terms mm -hmm. of their treatment. Usually people enter treatment at partial hospitalization program level of care. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it's really about stabilizing the most acute symptoms. Mm -hmm. We have a conversation about whether or not a patient is really ready to start um, the assessment as there are some questions that can be quite difficult to answer. Mm -hmm. Um, generally, it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis, but our mm -hmm. hope is to do that pretty early on in treatment, maybe within the first two to three weeks, mm -hmm. um, but really with thorough discussion with the team about the mm -hmm. readiness of the patient. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tree, could you give some examples of where this assessment can come handy in treatment, in the course of treatment? Absolutely. So mm -hmm. we often discuss attachment. It's one of the core areas that we're looking at for patients as they're in treatment. Mm -hmm. If we're noticing that there's a particular area of challenge and the mm -hmm. patient is telling us it's really difficult to connect with her baby, it's really you know been a challenge for her, um, mm -hmm. or she's having feelings of resentment towards baby, baby, we're really looking at that negative attribution. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, we certainly would want to prioritize working on attachment fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, great, right, thank you. How might, oh, this is a fabulous question, it just came in. In the hospital setting, if someone answers, in the hospital setting and someone answers sometimes to the EPDS question 10 as positive and has intrusive thoughts of self-harm but mm -hmm. without a plan, what are some of the concrete interventions that we can use? Absolutely. So. This is an often uh, a pretty common scenario that we see. Um, both Dr. Dava, you and I see a lot of consults um, for yes. women who are postpartum after delivery. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, all of these patients are screened with the EPDS and mm -hmm. it's not uncommon that they answer positively to question 10. Mm -hmm. 
I think the important piece here is really the distinction between an intrusive thought versus a self-harm thought with intent and a plan or mm -hmm. suicidal thoughts with intent and plan. Mm -hmm. Um, intrusive thoughts tend to be ego dystonic, meaning mm -hmm. distressing to the patient. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they may demonstrate that they're actually using more caution. Um, mm -hmm. In that case, I would say that that scenario is quite different than if it's a true suicidal or self-harm thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Regardless, we really talk about thorough safety planning mm -hmm. um, with not only the patient, but also supports. Mm -hmm. um, how do we mitigate the acute risk? Um, mm -hmm. For example, if it is truly a self-harm thought with intent, you know, removing any means to mm -hmm. things that could actually increase that risk. Mm -hmm. um, having a very clear plan for aftercare where mm -hmm. they will receive mental health support. Mm -hmm. And then really thinking about crisis situations. Um, here at El Camino, we often advise come, folks to come straight back to the hospital if they're in crisis, um, mm -hmm. and certainly calling 988 if they're at home and can't keep themselves safe. Mm -hmm. that's, yes, that's so critical and so important, the safety assessment and mm -hmm. also the assessment of infanticidal thoughts and urges. <clears throat> Next question from our audience, how might the intervention of supporting attachment slash supporting a client look? if the client or the patient has experienced multiple traumatic losses and detachment from their pregnancy, and they're using this as a protective coping mechanism during their current pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that this is actually something that we see fairly often in the MOMS program. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, you know, when a patient is in program, pregnant, expecting their child, and really having a difficult time attaching to that pregnancy, Mm -hmm. It's usually um, secondary to unresolved grief. Mm -hmm. Our role in the MOMS program is really to be able to understand um, any barriers between that attachment, and part of it is addressing the grief. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, one patient in particular comes to mind who um, we really explored ways um, that she would grieve the loss of mm -hmm. the baby that she had lost before mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, within her culture and within her religious background. Mm -hmm. She also included her partner in this experience, and mm -hmm. that was deeply meaningful for her to be able to process some of the grief. Mm -hmm. um, we are very cautious about really delving into the trauma itself, mm -hmm. um, but we do talk about the fact that the, um, you know, the detachment from the pregnancy emotionally can oftentimes be a protective mechanism, mm -hmm. and it's also important to resolve some of the issues that might be creating barriers to the attachment. Mm -hmm. Yes, important work. With regards to protective sleep as a way to mitigate symptoms that women experience in pregnancy and postpartum, what is the best way to answer this? So if a patient says, how do I sleep when I have to feed my baby every two hours? Yes, really common question that comes up. Um, the first, I think, is really recruiting supports, whether mm -hmm. that is um, a partner or another family member or a support person. Mm -hmm. The priority really is five to six hours uninterrupted sleep. Mm -hmm. Fabulous if it could be more, but generally most moms are comfortable with that period of time, mm -hmm. which means that they're likely to miss one or two feedings, especially in the newborn phase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My recommendation is really uh, fed babies the best, um, mm -hmm. whether that be pumped breast milk, formula, whatever the family is comfortable with, but mm -hmm. really recruiting support to protect that sleep. We mm -hmm. know that is one of the best ways to mitigate the risk for postpartum depression and anxiety. Yes, yes, absolutely. When should we initiate a postpartum wellness plan? Mm -hmm. I think it really depends on the readiness of the patient. Oftentimes what we see is when folks come into program, we're really stabilizing the acute symptoms. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, most patients start to work on the postpartum wellness plan a few mm -hmm. weeks prior to their graduation or their planned delivery date. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Uh, next question from our audience. When is it appropriate or not appropriate to dive into trauma work as a therapeutic intervention? An interesting yeah, question. Yeah, absolutely. So when we are in treatment in the MOMS program, um, the, the framework for that is time limited. We know that the patient will be with us for eight to 10 weeks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I, I personally believe it's very important for trauma work to occur with a long-term provider. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So our role really is to help a patient address areas where the trauma might be either um, become a barrier to attachment or may be leading to other symptoms mm -hmm. and requiring medication management. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately what we want to do is to be able to stabilize the most acute symptoms mm -hmm. and help that patient stabilize and then gradually transition into longer term trauma therapy once they're in, uh, after they've graduated from our program. Yes, yes. And <clears throat> thank you for that. Next question. Could you discuss how you have used the wellness plan with your patients who are coming from different cultures? Have there been any barriers to using the wellness plan? Mm -hmm. And um, any anecdotal cases you can talk about? Yeah, I think, you know, we see quite a diverse range of moms in the moms program. Mm -hmm. um, I think that many people in the Bay Area uh, end up coming here as transplants from different areas. Uh -huh. Yes. One of the challenges that I often see is actually quite a bit of isolation mm -hmm. and maybe mm -hmm. family is quite far away. Yes. So it really requires us to understand how do we expand that support network if mm -hmm. the nuclear family like grandparents or mm -hmm. uncles and aunties are not close by. Mm -hmm. um, I think that for a lot of people going through this, um, just normalizing that more support mm -hmm. is needed is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Um, and if possible, recruiting family members to come during that really, you know, vulnerable period of time. Yes, to support and help the patients, great. Um, the next question from our audience is, what are some of the first symptoms you see um, that indicate that the mother is struggling from a serious mental health issue when you first meet with the patient? So what are the presenting symptoms of a serious mental health illness? Yeah, in the mom's absolutely. Patient? Um, I think that the most common one that I see is a reduction in sleep. That's usually a very early warning sign um, mm -hmm. that serious symptoms mm -hmm. are evolving. And this could look like anywhere between one to two hours of sleep, could be even less. Mm -hmm. um, that level of insomnia often then can trigger an episode of postpartum psychosis, mm -hmm. uh, postpartum depression, and postpartum anxiety. Mm -hmm. Other things that we commonly see as early warning signs, um, the intrusive thoughts. So mm -hmm. really frequent, distressing, disturbing images of mm -hmm, seeing mm -hmm. you know, bad things happening either to oneself or to mm -hmm. baby. Um, sometimes seeing psychotic symptoms, auditory, visual hallucinations, um, mm -hmm. sometimes even delusions that incorporate the baby. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then the last, I think the most acute symptom that we worry about are any acute suicidal thoughts or homicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I would say that, you know, suicidal thoughts in this period of time as mental health s symptoms worsen um, mm -hmm. are fairly common and that's an indication that something serious is happening mm -hmm. and, and would probably require hospitalization. Yes, great. Well, thank you so much. These are you know, this is so helpful for our audience. We appreciate your talk and we appreciate your coming by here in person. And thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Dr. Dami.